I don't think Dad had a script that was written out that got us where we are today, but I think he had a vision that was pretty dang close. Opportunities come that you make happen, and then you seize those opportunities. My dad was Bob Gotch. Was born up in the Kindred, Nebraska area in a family of eight. His dad was a tough German. They grew up poor. They just come out of the Depression era, milking cows for half the milk and picking people's corn by hand and throwing in a horse-drawn wagon. So they knew what tough work was. All the sons, as soon as they became close to being old enough, they went and joined the army to go fight in World War II. My dad went in in 44 or 45, so it was near the end, and he was an MP in the Army. He was at the Nuremberg Trials, saw some things there that he didn't, uh, he didn't like talking about it. When young guys would go over into the military, they'd get these certificates that they could buy cigarettes with. So he was a cigarette trader in the military. So he had put together three, four, five thousand dollars in cash. Him and his brother Pat bought a gas station. They named it Elkhorn Oil Company. That's now called Frank's Conoco. They had a gas station, they had a service station, they hauled fuel oil, they picked corn for people, haul corn for people, haul hay for people. They did basically everything they could get their hands on for getting income. During the process that him and Pat were partners in the gas station is when he met uh, my mom, Lois. That would have been in the early 50s, so she would have been part of this whole process of switching over into the cattle feeding business. And for many years, she was the main accountant and she cooked for all of us and cleaned us up and sewed our clothes and she was a big part of what was going on in a lot of them early days. In the mid 50s, he leased a feed yard in Elkhorn from a doctor and he was feeding cattle for Foxley's company, Bill Foxley. So he was a custom cattle feeder at the time. He's still hauling corn to Foxley's feed yard, which is down on 72nd Street. He transitioned at that point. He fed his own first pen of cattle. The local banker here in town loaned him enough money to buy a couple loads of cattle. So he went down, bought them, fed them out. By the time he got the cattle done and shipped, he didn't have enough money to pay the loan back. He went back to the banker and said, look, cattle didn't bring much. I need to borrow more money to buy more cattle. And the banker says, I can't loan you any more bank money. But he said, I'll loan you some of my own personal money. So the banker, out of his own pocket, loaned him enough money to buy another set of cattle. And those cattle made enough money to pay off both loans. And that's basically what started Dad's career. The doctor that owned the feed yard that leased it to my dad passed away. He wrote in his will that his spouse had to sell the feed yard to my dad, but my dad didn't know that. He ended up buying the feed yard, and when he found out that the widow was instructed to sell it to him, his comment was, I sure could have bought that thing cheaper. Back in those days, you know, we didn't have feed wagons. Mixer wagons, I should say. We had horse-drawn wagons, so you'd have corn, and then you'd have the hay, and you'd have the protein and all that, and Dad would scoop down through the feed so that he'd get a little bit of corn, get a little bit of hay, get a little bit of protein, and he'd scoop it into the bunks, and that was the mixer. Now everything is tested on a daily basis. We use flake corn, and everything's mixed to a specific goal. Rations are made up for where the cattle is and their diet scenarios. It's very scientific today, and in the history, it was more hard work, and you made a guess. Bobby would have been the first one that would have been really exposed to being a man in a very dangerous situation as we look back today, but he would drive tractors at seven years old and he was working right with the men. So there was a story done about my brother when he was seven driving a car, which ended up being the, at the time, the youngest kid ever drive a car without a parent. And then that story was me driving a tractor on my dad's lap. So I think all of us went to work as soon as he didn't have to change our diapers. Yeah, he, he put us out there in the middle of it right away. As soon as we could walk, even in diapers, there was jobs for us to do. So every one of us, Bobby, Billy, myself, Barry, that was expected from all of us. You know, nobody outworked my dad, so it wasn't like he would expect you to do more than he was willing to do. He would work just as hard, if not harder, than anybody else. Dad always tested you, and he tested each one of us, and some of us more than others. How you responded to those tests was a big part of what your opportunities became going forward. I spent most of my time in the summer on the hay truck, which Dad called my, uh, my attitude adjuster. 
I don't think it ever worked. In the late 70s, my dad bought half interest in Junietta Feed Yards. Kenny Morrison was one of the partners. Kenny was like our first real partner and a great man, mentor to all of us. It was great for my dad because he was so calm. Kind of taught my dad a little bit of discipline as far as accounting and borrowing bases and insurance. He was a perfect guy for that. He decided, you know, I'm gonna build a restaurant and you guys are gonna work at the feed yard during the day and you're gonna go work supper time up at the restaurant. Some of us fought it harder than others. He wanted me to work there so bad, and uh, I just said, I ain't, I'm not doing it. Didn't want to put myself in a position with the public. There was nothing good that could happen to it. My people skills were questionable, so they put me back in the kitchen. We'd work the dinner hour, and we'd close the restaurant around 10 o'clock, and then we'd have the duties of cleaning up, and it was a humbling experience. I can tell you that uh, I never wanted to be in the restaurant business after I learned how tough that business is. We all put our time in up there, most of us. Never, not once. Some of us were a little bit more accepting to some duties that we didn't want to do. And, you know, Bill was a strong-minded guy just like my dad was. So if Bill decided he didn't want to do it, he just wouldn't do it. Probably because I was a lot like him. I didn't like to take orders. So we butted heads and I got my butt kicked a lot. <laughs> we worked outside until we were 21 years old. That's when dad would bring us in the office and start teaching us the business end of things. We had an old office building up in what we call the hill, which is the original feed yard. It was an old house, and we had 12 people in 1,100 square feet. Everybody got to know each other pretty well in there. We had a room in the back we called the war room. We had one table that we all shared. There was fist fights between the brothers, and my dad would try to break up, and I would be surprised there wasn't a couple fist fights that my dad was in in that back room. Gosh, all of us smoked cigarettes at the time, and all of us had two phones each, and it was a loud, noisy place, but it was wonderful. I could talk to people about the markets, but I sat right across from my dad, and I could listen to the deals he was making. I could listen to how he was handling people, and it was an opportunity that very few people really get, and I'll, I'll never forget those times. I killed a bunch of cattle one time because of inexperience. That was a huge lesson for me. Not only in, okay, don't make that mistake again because you uh, killed 43 cattle, but in how to handle a stressful scenario like that. Because I had to go up and get my dad out of the office and explain to him what happened. I really, literally thought I might not survive that scenario. We both walked down, we looked over the fence. He goes, did you learn anything from this? And I said, yep. And he goes, okay, don't let it happen again. I think as much as anything I learned, there's lessons, you learn them and you move forward. In 1980, my dad had a heart attack and my oldest brother Bobby went out to run operations out of Junietta. A few months of recovery, dad was packing his clothes to go back to Junietta and Bobby said, dad, why don't you stay in Elkhorn here and I'll, uh, I'll run the feed yard operations out there. That's how Bobby ended up going out and living in Hastings and raising his family there and running that operation and building Red Cloud. How I found out about it was my dad says, hey, we're buying a feed yard in Garden City, Kansas. I said, oh, wow, who's gonna run that? He just pointed at me and he said, you are. And I said, okay, when we go? And he said, tomorrow. My brother Bobby came along, we inventoried the feed yard and went back to the co-op and wrote him a check that afternoon for $1.25 million for a feed yard. That was it. I moved to Garden City, Kansas at that point. I was lucky enough to have a guy named Larry Christensen come along with me, him and his wife and family. Larry was a good man and worked hard and was a big part of making that feed yard successful. We leased a ranch called Pawnee Springs from the Kiewit Foundation. Our family and the Timberman family partnered up. It was really our first look at a big cow operation like this. Timberman's was a great partner for us. He had a lot of experience in the cow business. My brother Bobby got to be a big part of that operation with the Timberman's as well as my dad. We all went out and worked for branding time and roundup times and all that too. We leased it for 10 years and then we bought it. We took 36,000 acres and Timmerman took about 34,000 acres. We still own that ranch today and we have some great people out there and Steve Bozart runs the place for us and super excited about continuing that heritage. My brother Bobby was super excited about that opportunity and he uh, did the design, 
and was there active in all the construction and we still have that feed yard today. It's now at 60,000 head. When it was originally built, it was 40,000 head. 1988, we closed the Elkhorn feed yard that we all grew up learning our business and all that, which was kind of a sad day, but at the same time, it was time. It didn't really fit our business model anymore. In 1990, I decided that I could see my dad's health deteriorating, and I knew that he was the guy that I was gonna learn the business from. And I was 450 miles away, and I wasn't getting the opportunity that I felt like I needed to. I had Larry Christensen with me in, in Deerfield, and I knew he could handle the operations without me, without a doubt. I asked my dad if I could come back. And so in 1990, I moved back to Elkhorn, and I sat across the table from him again, which was important for me. One day, I threw my glasses down on the table and I threw my pin on the table and I started cussing and my dad says, is life getting a little tough for you today? And I said, Pops, I just can't get it all done. I, I don't even know what to do. And he, and he just looked at me and says, take that yellow pad and make a list and prioritize. From that moment on, I knew how to handle the things that were, that would make my emotions um, out of control. You've had those life moments, we all have them, but you know, you remember the strangest little things at times. Whenever dad would make money, he would buy land. And he would buy land in the Elkhorn area knowing that Omaha at some point would move far enough west where that land would have some value for development. That was a big part of our growth in the future as well. We would take the money from that increased value and we could buy ranches and we could buy additional feed yards. Instead of taking his money and investing in the stock market, he took that money and invested into land, which he knew that within 10, 15 years, the value of that would increase enough that it would help expand the business. A lot of the stuff that we do and continue to do with buying farm ground around the feed yards and all those things was a big part of our ability to grow. I was complaining a little bit one day about not being able to get a tee time and never been able to play golf. I'm sure cussing was part of that. And Dad said, what's the problem? And we told him. I said, well, you got to make a tee time seven days in advance because businesses are so busy these days. And he said, well, hell, why don't you just build one? Which seems like, oh, God, they got a ton of money, let's go do that. But that's not where he's coming from, supply and demand. And when we built the golf course in 91, open 92, it's hit the ground. It's been running ever since. It's been great. Funny story about the beginning of that construction. So I was just meeting with my irrigation guy and he was getting going on the east side of the creek and we were meeting and I said, so how do you get the water across the creek? And he says, well, I attach it to your bridges. And I go, oh, bridges, we need bridges. We were going so fast and building this thing, we, we kind of forgot to call and order bridges. So Brett called a guy and he says, they're gonna be $25,000 a piece. I can get you the first one in eight weeks. I'm like, oh my God. I got to get bridges. I need the first one in two weeks. So I called my brother Bobby. I said, Bobby, I need some help. I got myself in a fix. I need bridges. Bobby said, okay, send me plans. So I called my dad and I said, Dad, Bobby needs a picture of some bridges. I said, can you help me with that? And he says, yeah, I'll take care of it. Dad sent a guy swinging across the creek from on a rope from a tree. And he said, build the damn bridges. So that was it. Two weeks later, I got my first bridge. Six weeks after that phone call is when I got my last bridge. They cost $5,000 a piece. Bobby saved me in that one. Ten thousand plus acre, beautiful Flint Hills Ranch. It's one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been on in my life. Bob and I decided that we might want to get into the hog production business. So we partnered up with uh, Jim Pillen in a company called GGP, so Gotch Gotch Pillen. Jim was the managing partner of that operation. Our first hogs that we ever sold was in 1998, which was the worst hog market in the history of the hogs. We sold them for eight cents a pound. My dad passed away in 2002 after a six year battle with emphysema and heart disease. And it was a tough last six years for him. Dan was a super hard worker and his expectations of himself were really high. 
and therefore his expectations of anybody else that worked with him were really high. You had to become a man to work for my dad. He kind of became known as a builder of men for that purpose. I mean, he wanted to make men out of his boys. It was important to him. He brought people in from outside the family, treated them like his own kids, gave them opportunities. But if they weren't willing to take it on, then he didn't have any time for you. He, will, he would give you opportunities, but you had to be ready to step up and do it. Just the other day, I was sitting in my office. The market had been challenging lately, and I was kind of down a little bit on you know, what, what was going on in our industry. And I sat back and I thought for a minute, I said, all right, let's break this down. What are the areas that we are challenged with and where are we doing great? And the list of things that we do really, really well was really impressive. And it kind of took me back to that yellow tablet. I was able to focus on the things that we needed to fix and it was a short list and it was that prioritization lesson that my dad gave me. I think he just looked and said what needs to be done today and he did that and with the opportunity to expand come along and it was a good opportunity he expanded. Opportunities came from making money in commodities. Opportunities came from land investments that he made. Now we've gotten a lot bigger since he's retired, of course, but he would have done the same thing. My brother Bobby passed away in a shocking manner. He, he had a heart attack. None of us saw it coming. That was one of those moments, you know, you just, you never forget him. It was a shock to everybody, not only his family, but the employees of the company. Bob was a very caring person. He, he uh, went over and above the call of duty to take care of other people. I think one of the biggest impacts that Bobby had on our company was he converted us from a company of the Nike style of doing business to actually caring about your people and motivating them and doing the things that it takes to really get the most out of people. And that could be as much the change in people over time. Back when my dad was doing things, people were self-motivated. They didn't need somebody to tap them on the back and tell them how great of a job they did. But you know, we all, as we grow up and mature and things change, society changes things. And Bobby was probably the first guy that in our business that really spent the time to be involved in people's lives and, and he was loved. Bob was loved by everybody. I think we're stronger than we ever were. There's some things that I wish dad would have been here. The work ethic that is throughout the company, it was him because he worked hard and he, made, and he demanded everybody else work hard. His style would not work today. You know, he was from, I'm sure Brett said, the Nike camp, just do it. You know, that doesn't, cut, that doesn't cut it anymore. You can't do that. But the work ethic, definitely. We got some really good people working for us, and I don't, not knock on dad, I don't know if they would have worked for dad because they have their own minds, their own ideas, and you know, you gotta, you gotta hear what other people have to say. We talk about culture and how the Gotch Company has a culture, and a lot of it is from my dad's leadership, which of course it is, but there are people that have not only helped shape this company, but they helped shape my dad and we have employees that have worked with us for 30 plus years. They have helped shape who we are today and they helped shape that from 30 years ago. And when I look back at 60 years, that's more than my lifetime. And I have known nothing different. So people look at our company and they think, how do these guys do it? I look at it as, I don't know, that's just the way it is, that's who we are. I just wanted to thank everybody else that helped shape this company and helped us get here. It's uh, meant a lot to me, it's meant a lot to a lot of people, and I see a bright future for us. I went out there and grabbed him and drug him out in the parking lot and just beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Restaurants pay in the ass. You can put that in there too. <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs>